Okay, it is my honor uh, to introduce Nikolai Slavov. Um, we have to take a minute off the introduction, so I'll just get to the, the, the good, well, the best stuff. So uh, Nikolai did his PhD at MIT um, and a postdoc postdoctoral studies at Princeton. And during that time studying the interplay between the cell, uh, gene expression, and metabolism. But since his time at Northeastern, um, Nikolai has really become one of our shining stars in research and is generally recognized as the world's expert, or I would say the world's expert, maybe another person will say a world's expert uh, in single cell uh, proteomics. So, um, and also the, the uh, CEO and director of Parallel Squared, which uh, at this point, take a look at Nikolai's uh, um, uh, web page to look into that, but it's fascinating. Uh, quite a bit of money coming in and amazing research. So with that, Nikolai, looking forward to your talk. Hold on just a second, folks. I'm going to talk about some of our more established results on increasing the sensitivity and resolution of protein measurements. But first, I'm going to share with you what I think is really astounding, uh, demonstrating how little we knew, how little we knew about the sequences of the proteins in our bodies. And hopefully, the slides are going to cooperate and we'll get to share with you those results. Otherwise, chalk talk. I love I I love chalk talks. <laughs> All right. So let's start putting the proteome in context. If we think of a single human cell, we know that it has a giant genome, and the genome is right here at the bottom. You can barely see it dwarfed by the proteome. There are many more amino acids building up the proteins in our bodies and their nucleotides. And it's not just sheer mass of the amino acids, it's also complexity. As we go from DNA to RNA to proteins, there is dramatic increase in the level of chemical interactome complexity. And that remains a major challenge for us to study and analyze. So instead, what we are very good at doing is sequencing nucleic acids, and then we can find associations between genetic polymorphisms and human disease. And this has been a phenomenally productive enterprise. That's where the light shines, and that's where the research community has focused on examining those associations. But those associations are fairly indirect. So for anyone, genetic modification to exert its influence and ultimately result in neurodegenerative disease or cancer, that goes through protein and metabolite interactions. And those are largely in the dark. So what do we do when we want to see in the dark? Let's shine light. We want to shine more light on the proteome and the metabolome, and in fact, the Burnett Institute is very well suited to contribute in this direction. But let's start by considering what do we know about the proteome. In particular, how do we know the sequences of the proteins building up your bodies? This slide summarizes the fundamentals. So we start with this idea that the DNA sequence is a template, and then this template somehow is converted into a protein sequence. How is it converted into a protein sequence? Well, this young man by the name of Marshall Nuremberg, at the time when Barry Carger was in college, did some in vitro experiments. He, he was, that, that happened in the 60s when he did the experiments. He received the Nobel Prize in 1968, but the experiments were done in the intramural wing of NIH in early 1960s. And the experiments were done... <laughs> All right. <laughs> shortly, shortly before... <laughs> shortly before Barry Carger joined Northeastern, this fellow... Nuremberg did those experiments, and he did these experiments with homopolymers of nucleic acids in vitro. 
So these are not experiments happening in the human body. They're done in vitro with homopolymers of nucleic acids. And from that, he figured out what is a table that we still call the genetic code. It gives a correspondence between a certain sequence of three nucleotides and an amino acid. And this is what we use 65 years later to predict what are the protein sequences. And the word predict is very precise in this context. Most of the time when we analyze the proteome by the very sophisticated technologies that we have, we use those predictions as being the hypothesis that we test the majority of the time. Okay, so now knowing that, what about possible deviations from the genetic code? Do we always get the exact correspondence in the genetic code? Well, we actually know there are some exceptions. There is selenocysteine, which is not in the genetic code table of Marshall Nuremberg. But we also have some evidence from artificial fluorescent constructs in cell lines that this process is not very precise and accurate. They're actually, with these artificial fluorescent constructs, there are a number of examples when we know the amino acid that is incorporated does not correspond to the genetic code table of Marshall Nuremberg. And this frequency for the fluorescent constructs is somewhere in the realm of a few percent or lower. But what we wanted to investigate is what is about endogenous proteins in the human proteome? What is this frequency for the proteins that build up our bodies? And what I'm going to tell you about is about the best we can do at the moment and it's going to look at only the tip of the iceberg. We cannot detect the full ocean of protein molecules and modifications that make up our tissues. It's just too deep, even for the best technologies that we have. So we can do this by knowing that if an amino acid in the predicted protein sequence is being substituted with another amino acid, this is going to result in a very predictable change in the mass spectra. And using this knowledge, we can process billions upon billions of mass spectra from thousands of human patients and nucleic acid sequences because we want to know for any one patient what is the genome sequence, what is the transcriptome sequence, and what are these amino acid differences in the proteins building up the body of this patient. So this is a very large scale uh, uh, exercise in analyzing terabytes of data a phenomenal work done by a doctoral student at Northeastern University, Shuri Tsur. And when Shuri did this work, she was able to identify millions of peptides that have modifications, and about 60,000 of those peptides had sequences that are not predicted by the genetic code of Marshall Nuremberg. And that was exciting, but was also surprising, so we spent a long time examining by various methods the fidelity and the accuracy of, of this analysis and these results. And I'm not going to tell you all of the ways in which we did that. I'll tell you one of those, which is to use the recent power of machine learning, of uh, deep learning in this context, to very accurately predict fragmentation spectra from sequence for peptides. And then we can use this information, predicted fragmentation spectra, predicted retention times, that chromatographic separation that Barry Carger and his team have done so much to pioneer. So we can do these predictions and use them to reevaluate our confidence in those newly discovered protein sequences. Are we going to increase or decrease our confidence? So when we incorporate this information, we see that uniformly for the vast majority of those peptides we have higher, not lower confidence. So that's good. Now, here comes what has been the biggest surprise for us and something that gave us a pause of many years trying to understand and, uh, and troubleshoot. And this relates to what is the abundance of those protein sequences that we did not know that the genetic code does not predict. So here we have on the top the protein whose sequence is predicted by the genetic code. And here on the bottom we have the sequence that we find in the mass spec data, the sequence that was present for a protein in a human patient. And then we can ask, what is the relative abundance of those two proteins? And we find that in vast majority of cases, these proteins with new sequences that are not predicted by the genetic code are low. They're present at a few orders of magnitude lower abundance than what 
we know classically, and that's sort of consistent with the expectation that Marshall and Nuremberg did something really important that captures a lot of the variance in the data. But here on the top, we have thousands of proteins whose sequences are different from what the genetic code predicts, and they're more abundant than their counterpart predicted by the, uh, by the genetic code. So how is that possible, what's going on here? We can ask, what is the potential contribution of tRNAs that have similar codons to what the genetic code contains, but not identical, meaning that when codon and anticodon recognize each other, there is a single nucleotide mismatch. And when we see that when there is a single codon mismatch, we have much higher rate of incorporating a different amino acid, 50-fold higher rate. So this provides direct evidence that translation itself, the incorporation of those amino acids, and specifically not recognizing the right cognate tRNA contributes to the production of these proteins that we didn't know about, that they're so abundant. We also see another very strong association, again, implicating the tRNA matching you know, with the messenger RNAs. And specifically, we see that the more rare the codon is, the higher the abundance of these products of alternative translation that we didn't know about, and that, again, strongly links the production of these alternative protein products to the process of translating messenger RNAs. But again, I'll remind you here that we are looking at proteins whose sequences, for the most part, we never knew about because we never looked at them. We have been examining the proteome through this very narrow set of hypotheses based on in vitro data from the time when Barry Cargo was a very young man. And now, now we are coming to a point. <laughs> <laughs> and now we find that, in fact, what's happening with the proteome is actually more complex and more interesting. All right. But how, how can we understand these protein products? So are they stable? And mass spectrometry, again, gives us a wonderful tool to very directly answer this question. We can use a metabolic pulse chase to study the rate of new protein synthesis and the rate of old protein degradation to ask whether those protein products that we are finding with different sequences are stable or not. And when we look at primary cells, we find that these proteins are actually very stable. And that provides a beautiful explanation as to why they're highly abundant. So when these proteins are produced in your cells, even if they're produced, uh, synthesized at somewhat lower rate than the proteins based on the genetic code, if they're stable, over time they can incorporate. And in fact, age is an important variable to consider in that equation. It could be that over time with these stable proteins, with advanced age, they get incorporated into higher and higher levels. And then we can find a lot of illustrative patterns that start to explain how this really works. We find that the abundance of those products is, str is strongly dependent on the amino acid sequences. When certain amino acids are substituted, we see that the corresponding protein products are much more abundant. We can identify motifs in the protein sequences that can explain which are the places where, those altern where the alternative translation is going to happen. We find that these things are, high, are associated with high level of intrinsic protein disorder that relates to protein structure that we discussed earlier. And there are all sorts of very interesting aspects that we're just beginning to dive into. But I'm going to stop here on this journey because I also want to tell you about another aspect of looking at the human proteome, not just at the sequences, but being able to analyze the dynamics of proteins and with high resolution. And this relates to the fact that the cells that build up our bodies and the cells that are part of our in vitro experiments in the laboratory are very diverse. Here you see a cancer cell that is covered by a couple of lymphocytes. They look very different. And when we analyze their proteomes, when we measure an apoptotic protein, we want to know whether the apoptosis is happening in the cancer cell or it's happening in the lymphocytes. That makes a difference. So we have 
thought for a long time how we can develop methods for analyzing proteins in individual mammalian cells. And that was the, the first big project as I joined Northeastern in my group that has progressed despite concerns at the time that this is not feasible, that the technology cannot be developed over time. We and others went through proof of concept and demonstration to developing increasing array of methods that can not only measure protein abundances in single cells, but increasingly are able to measure protein uh, synthesis and degradation rates and interactions and modifications. And just to give you a snapshot of where we currently are, we are able to prepare order thousands of single cells per day. And this is thanks to work of another PhD student in my group, Andrew Leduc, who had a poster in the lobby. And we are able to analyze order 1,000 at the moment of, of the single cells while quantifying a few thousand proteins in, in the proteome of a single cell. So this is the sample preparation workflow that, that we've developed for taking a single cell and delivering the proteome to the MASPEC instrument. Everything happens in one of these tiny droplets. And these droplets sit on the surface of glass lights, microscopic glass lights. And because we can array a large number of these droplets next to each other, we can process in parallel a very large number of single cells and then analyze them to um, uh, quantify their proteomes. So that is on the side of sample preparation, on the side of mass spectrometry data acquisition. We have developed uh, different conceptual frameworks for dealing with the complexity of the proteome. One of those is to use real-time instrument control. And here again, data analytics comes in to be able to focus the instrument time on the most uh, biologically relevant proteins for the study. So you can think of the mass spec instrument as being in your position. You have too many things, you have more things on your plate than what you can possibly do. And the real-time instrument control comes in to tell the instrument what are the priorities, which are the biologically most relevant important proteins to analyze in what order, and that results in much higher data completeness, higher sensitivity, higher quantitative accuracy, and focus on the relevant protein molecules. The other approach has been if you have too many things that you would like to do, let's do them in parallel. And this is really the approach of Plex DIA that I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, in detail, so the fundamental idea is very simple, even if the technical implementation is not, but the fundamental idea is that we want to be able to analyze at the same time proteins from large number of single cells, parallel sample analysis, and we want in parallel to fragment a very large number of, of peptides. And if we're able to do both of these things in parallel, then our throughput is going to be the product of doing two things in parallel. So that's what we wanted to do. And we demonstrated here at Northeastern that we can do this very well. So here is how the raw data of this analysis looks like. And we can obtain multiple independent data points per peptide per single cell, which gives us reliability estimates and gives us high data quality. And of course, we can scale this zooming out to many proteins. We can quantify a large number of proteins in single cells. And these approaches in this technology was noticed, as uh, David Lazzi mentioned this morning, by uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, Convergent Research, Ken Griffin, and others. And they supported our effort with the intention of accelerating the rate of those technological developments, the rate of building these methods. So, as we climb this pyramid of increasing the throughput while preserving data quality, they provided for us resources to establish a nonprofit research institute here in the Boston area where we develop um, uh, barcoding small molecules that we can use to increase the number of cells that we can analyze in parallel, while at the same time also favor uh, fragmentation and fragmentized production that support reliable sequence identification. And I have only a few minutes left, so I'll give you a sweeping survey over one example project of what these single cell protein measurements have enabled. 
uh, from, from the menus, and that is going to do with the very beginning of uh, your lives. One, once upon a time, we all were a single cell, right? And then that single cell became two cells, and then four cells. And the question is, when did these cells start being different? We have some circumstantial evidence that even at the two cell stage, these cells are different in terms of developmental potential, but it has been very difficult to find the molecular associates, correlates of those differences. Dozens of high powered groups around the world have done single cell RNA sequencing of those two cell stage blastomeres, and they have found very few messenger RNAs to differ. But when Alex Patelsky, another PhD student in my group, measured proteins in those sister blastomeres, we found that actually those sister blastomeres are quite different in their molecular buildup of proteins. There are hundreds of proteins that are differentially abundant in such a way that each sister blastomere is part of this cluster and the other sister blastomere is of the other cluster, to a degree that Patelsky could now term these clusters alpha and beta, and we could see that their difference increases uh, as development progresses. So that's good. We have some molecular correlates. But then the question was, does this really functionally matter? Are these proteins associated with the distinct developmental potential of the blastomeres? And to ask this question, we did an experiment where we separated the two blastomeres from early stage embryos. One blastomere we analyzed with mass spectrometry to determine its type. The other one we grew into early stage embryo to be able to characterize its phenotypic developmental potential. And what we found is that beta blastomeres are much more likely to give rise to functional embryos supporting the notion that these molecular protein differences that are not reflected in the transcriptome are determining the developmental potential of the blastomeres. And furthermore, we found that these differences are highly conserved across different mammals, mouse and human, and that perhaps not surprisingly in hindsight, they're mostly mediated by protein transport and protein degradation. Again, they say in hindsight, this is kind of obvious that during the early development when the genome is mostly silent, this is prior to the genome's zygotic activation, all the action is at the level of proteins being transported and degraded. And there are many other additional cases where we've seen that looking at the protein level uh, gives us a unique perspective that is completely undetectable at the transcriptome. One such example over which we've done a variety of different projects is interpreting single cell protein covariation. Uh, one particular project for that is studying epithelial to mesenchymal transition. It's a protein that takes adherent epithelial cells and make them highly motile cells. It's a key process in, metast in metastasis and cancer progression. And in this case, we see that protein measurements can give us uh, a view of changes in the cytoskeletal apparatus of these cells that are not detectable by anything else. And I'm going to skip here a few more slides uh, just to touch a bit on the technology. So what I'm telling you in terms of developments uh, of better seeing the proteome has two fundamental driving forces in my view. One force is really the intellectual. And for me, that is the foundational, most important, pivotal driving force. It's the ideas of how we can do things differently. It is the experimental design. It is the questions that we ask. But another important aspect to that that empowers the intellectual ideas and the prowess is really the technology, the instruments, the hardware that enables us to collect data that make our ideas concrete empirical evidence, makes them demonstrable, not just ideas. And it's a very exciting time in the world of mass spectrometry where using different modalities, including separation, now gas phase separation, by trapped ion mobility, we are able to implement new approaches as shown here by, by these methods of optimizing data acquisition. And one way of demonstrating this progress is to look at the increase of sensitivity and throughput of methods over the last period of 10 years or so. So for each year, I've chosen a representative paper that was at the state of the art, at the tip of what we could do at that point. 
And you can see how the number of data points that we can acquire has grown by orders of magnitude while we have become sensitivity has increased over 10,000 fold. And all of these advances continue to grow powered by new instrumentation, new approaches to data interpretation. And very, very, very importantly, crucial to all of this are the new conceptual ideas of how do we do things. This is the driving force of our young students and young scientists and our faculty who don't take no for an answer, who don't take the experiments done 65 years ago as telling us all oh, that we know for the proteome, but they, they want to see things in a different way. They, that they don't, uh, I, I see that they have very little time here. I was getting inspired. Okay, so <laughs> despite, despite having very little time, I'll just quickly touch on another aspect of community building. That is traditionally a strong part of Burnett Institute and something that we played a lot of emphasis on. We always make sure that we share data and metadata and make it possible for others to build upon it. We have worked to develop guidelines and recommendations for others to implement workflows that we've developed. And of course, we've had a lot of fun in doing all of this work here at Northeastern and now at uh, Parallel Square Institute, Burnett Institute as well. And I'll just highlight um, Shurit Sur and Rainer who have done most of the work for alternative translation that I told you at the beginning of my talk. And Andrew LeDuc has developed the sample preparation that I mentioned, Jason Dirks, the Plex DI approach, and Alex Petelsky, as I already mentioned, did the embryo work. I'll stop here, and I'll be happy to answer questions if we have the time for it. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, very inspiring. So to see that the uh, throughput can achieve like 3,000 or 1,000 sales per day. So considering using the scope protocol that like you need to do the uh, multiplexing uh, and with a very short gradient. So I'm wondering, have you done some like uh, comparison about the uh, uh, suppression, racial suppression effect of the multiplexing? Uh, could you give some comments on that? We, we've done a lot of benchmarking for all of the methods that we've developed with spiked in standards and other approaches. In some cases, there is racial suppression for other methods such as PlexDA, that's not an issue. For when using isobaric mass stacks, there is, co there is always co-isolation and that co-isolation results in smaller uh, ratios than expected, yeah. All right, I'm sorry. We'll have to take other questions during the coffee break. I'm very sorry, we're running behind. But um, we're, we caught up during this session. So uh, let's take a minute to thank Professor Slava. That was amazing. Thank you.